Hi witches and wizards and welcome back to another reading of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Today we're going to be reading chapter four. four. Chapter four at Flourish and Blocks. Life at the borough was as different as possible from life on Privet Drive. The Dursleys liked everything neat and ordered. The Weasley's house burst with strange and unexpected. Harry got a shock the, the first time he looked in the mirror over the kitchen mantelpiece and it shouted, Tuck your shirt in, Scruffy. The ghoul in the attic howled and dropped pipes whenever he felt things were getting too quiet, and small explosions from Fred and George's room were considered perfectly normal. What Harry found most unusual about life at Ron's, however, wasn't the talking mirror or the clanking ghoul. It was the fact that everybody there seemed to like him. Mrs. Weasley fussed over the state of his socks and tried to force him to eat fourth helpings at every meal. Mr. Weasley liked Harry to sit next to him at the dinner table so that he could bombard him with questions about life with muggles, asking him to explain how things like plugs and the postal service worked. Fascinating, he would say, as Harry talked him through using a telephone. Ingenious, really, how many ways muggles have found of getting along without magic. Harry heard from Hogwarts one sunny morning about a week after he had arrived at the borough. He and Ron went down to breakfast to find Mr. and Mrs. Weasley and Jenny already sitting at the kitchen table. The moment she saw Harry, Jenny accidentally knocked her porridge bowl to the floor with a loud clatter. Jerry se Jenny seemed very prone to knocking things over whenever Harry entered the room. She dived under the table to retrieve the bowl and emerged with her face glowing like the sunset. Pretending he hadn't noticed this, Harry sat down, took the toast Mrs. Weasley offered him. Letters from school, said Mr. Weasley, passing Ron and Harry identical envelopes of yellowish parchment addressed in green ink. Dumbledore already knows you're here, Harry. Doesn't miss a trick, that man. You've two got them, too, he added as Fred and George ambled in, still in their pajamas. For a few minutes, there was silence as they read their letters. Harry told him to catch the Hogwarts Express, as usual, from King's Cross Station on September the 1st. There was a list of new books he would need for the coming year as well. Second year students will require The Standard Book of Spells, Grade 2, by Miranda Godshock. Gosh, Hawk. Break with a Banshee, by Gilderoy Lockhart. Gating with Ghouls, by Gilderoy Lockhart. Holidays with Hags, by Gilderoy Lockhart. Travels with Trolls, by Gilderoy Lockhart. Voyages with Vampires by Gilderoy Lockhart. Wanderings with Wolves by Gilderoy Lockhart. Year with the Yeti by Gilderoy Lockhart. Fred, who had finished his own list, peered over at Harry's. You've been told to get all Lockhart's books too, he said. The new Defense Against the Arts teacher must be a fan. Bet it's a witch. At this point, Fred caught his mother's eye and quickly busied himself with the marmalade. That lot won't come cheap, said George with a quick look at his parents. Lockhart's books are really expensive. We'll, we'll manage, said Mrs. Weasley, but she looked worried. I expect we'll be able to pick up a lot of Ginny's things second hand. Oh, are you starting at Hogwarts this year? Harry asked Ginny. She nodded blushed to the roots of her flaming hair, and put her elbow in the butter dish. Fortunately, no one saw this except Harry, because this just then Ron's elder brother Percy walked in. He was already dressed, his Hogwarts prefect badge pinned to his sweater vest. Morning all, he said briskly. Lovely day. He sat down in the only remaining chair, but leapt up again almost immediately, pulling from underneath him a molting gray feather duster. At least, that's what Harry thought it was, until he saw it was breathing. Arrow, said Ron, taking the limp out from Percy and extracting a letter from under its wing. Finally, he's got Hermione's answer. I wrote to her saying you were going to try and rescue you from the Dursleys. He carried Errol to a perch just inside the back door and tried to stand him up on it, but Errol flopped straight off again, so Ron lay him on the draining board instead, muttering, Pathetic. Then he ripped open Hermione's letter and read it aloud. Dear Ron, and Harry if you're there, I hope everything went all right and that Harry is okay and that you didn't do anything illegal to get him out, Ron, because that would get Harry into more trouble. 
I've been really worried, and if Harry is all right, will you please let me know at once? But perhaps it would be better if you used a different owl, because I think another delivery might finish your one off. I'm very busy with schoolwork, of course. How can she be? said Ron in, hor in horror. We're on vacation, and we're going to London next Wednesday to buy my new books. Why don't we meet in Diagon Alley? Let me know what's happening as soon as you can. Love from Hermione. Well, that fits in nicely. We can go and get all your things then, too, said Mrs. Weasley, staring, starting to clear the table. What are you all up to today? Harry, Ron, Fred, and George were planning to go up the hill to a small paddock that the Weasleys owned. It was surrounded by trees that blocked it from view of the village below, meaning that they could practice quidditch there as long as they didn't fly too high. They couldn't use real Quidditch balls, which would have been hard to explain if they had escaped and flown away over the village. Instead, they threw apples to one another for one another to catch. They took turns riding Harry's Nimbus 2000, which was easily the best broom. Ron's old shooting star was often outstripped by passing butterflies. Five minutes later, they were marching up the hill, broomsticks over their shoulder, they had asked Percy if he wanted to join them, but he had said he was busy. Harry had only seen Percy at mealtime so far. He stayed shut in his room the rest of the time. Wish I knew what he was up to, said Fred, frowning. He's not himself. His exam results came the day before you did. Twelve owls, and he hardly gloated at all. Ordinary wizarding levels, George explained, seeing Harry's puzzled look. Bill got 12, too. If we're not careful, we'll have another head boy in the family. I don't think I could stand the shame. Bill was the eldest Weasley brother. He and the next brother, Charlie, had already left Hogwarts. Harry had never met either of them, but knew that Charlie was in Romania studying dragons and Bill in Egypt working for the Wizards Bank Gringotts. Don't know how Mom and Dad are going to afford all of our school stuff this year said George after a while. Five sets of Lockhart books, and Jenny needs robes and a wand and everything. Harry said nothing. He felt a bit awkward. Stored in an underground vault at Gringotts in London was a small fortune that his parents had left him. Of course, it was only in the wizarding world that he had money. You couldn't use galleons, sickles, and nuts in muggle shops. He had never even mentioned his Gringotts bank account to the Dursleys. He didn't think their horror of anything connected with magic would stretch to a large pile of gold. Mrs. Weasley woke them early the following Wednesday. After a quick half a dozen bacon sandwiches each, they pulled on their coats and Mrs. Weasley took a flower pot off the kitchen mantelpiece and peered inside. We're running low, Arthur, she sighed. We'll have to buy some more today. Ah, oh, well, guess first. It's after you, Harry, dear. She offered him the flower pot. Harry stared at all of them watching him. Uh, what am I supposed to do? He stammered. He's never traveled by flu powder, said Ron suddenly. Sorry, Harry, I forgot. Never, said Mr. Weasley. But how did you get to Diagon Alley to buy your school things last year? I went on the underground. Really? said Mr. Weasley eagerly. Were there escape tours? How exactly? Not now, Arthur said Mrs. Weasley. Flu powder's a lot quicker, dear, but goodness me if you've never used it before. It'll be all right, Mum, said Fred. Harry, watch us first. He took a pinch of glittering powder out of the flower pot, stepped up to the fire, threw the powder into the flames. With a roar, the fire turned emerald green, rose higher than Fred, who stepped right into it and shouted, Die gone alley, and vanished. You must speak Clearly, dear, Miss Weasley told Harry as George dipped his hand into the flower pot. And be sure to get out at the right grate. The right what? Harry said nervously as the fire roared and whipped George out of sight too. Well, there are an awful lot of wizard fires to choose from, you know. But as long as you've spoken clearly, he'll be fine, Molly. Don't fuss, said Mr. Weasley, helping himself to flu powder too. But dear, if he got lost, how would we ever explain to his aunt and uncle? They wouldn't mind, Harry reassured her. Dudley would think it was a brilliant joke if I got lost up a chimney. 
Don't worry about that. Well, all right. You go after Arthur, said Mrs. Weasley. Now, when you get into the fire, say where you're going. And keep your elbows tucked in, Ron advised. And your eyes shut, said Mrs. Weasley, the soot. Don't fidget, said Ron, or you might, well, fall out of the wrong fireplace. But don't panic and don't get out too early. Wait until you see Fred and George. Trying hard to bear all this in mind, Harry took a pinch of flu powder and walked to the edge of the fire. He took a deep breath, scattered the powder into the flames, and stepped forward. The fire felt like a warm breeze. He opened his mouth and immediately swallowed a lot of hot ash. Da 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 golly, he coughed. It felt as though he was being sucked down a giant drain. He seemed to be spinning very fast. The roaring in his ears were deafening. He tried to keep his eyes shut, but the whirl of green flames made him sick. Something hard knocked his elbow, and he tucked it in tightly, still spinning and spinning. Now it felt as though cold hands were slapping his face. Squinting through his glasses, he saw a blur, blurred stream of fireplaces and snatched glimpses of the rooms beyond. His bacon sandwiches were churning inside of him. He closed his eyes, wishing it would stop, and then he fell face first into cold stone and felt the bridge of his nose on his glasses snap. Dizzy and bruised, covered in soot, he got gingerly to his feet, holding his broken glasses up to his eyes. He was quite alone, but where he was, he had no idea. All he could tell was that he was standing in a stone fireplace of what looked like a large, dimly lit wizard's shop, but nothing in here was ever likely to be on the Hogwarts school list. A glass case nearby held a withering hand on a cushion, a blood-stained pack of cards, and a staring glass eye. Evil-looking masks stared down from the walls, an assortment of human bones lay upon the counter, and rusty, spiked instruments hung from the ceiling. Even worse, the dark, narrow street Harry could see through the dusty shop window was definitely not Diagon Alley. The sooner he got out of here, the better. Nose still singing where it had hit the hearth, Harry made his way swiftly and silently towards the door. But before he got halfway toward it, two people appeared on the other side of the glass, and one of them was the very last person that Harry wanted to meet when he was lost, covered in soot, and wearing broken glasses. Draco Malfoy. Harry looked quickly around and spotted a large black cabinet to his left. He shot inside and pulled the door closed, leaving a small crack to peek through. Seconds later, a bell clanged and Malfoy stepped into the shop. The man who followed could only be Draco's father. He had the same pale, pointed face and identical cold gray eyes. Mr. Malfoy crossed the shop, looking lazily at the items on display, and rang a bell on the counter before turning to his son and saying, Touch nothing, Draco. Malfoy, who had reached for the glass eye, said, I thought you were going to buy me a present. I said I would buy you a racing broom, said his father, drumming his fingers on the counter. What's the good of that if I'm not on the house team, said Malfoy, looking sulkily and bad-tempered. Harry Potter got a Nimbus 2000 last year, special permission from Dumbledore, so that he could play for Gryffindor. He's not even that good. It's just because he's famous. Famous for some stupid scar on his forehead. Malfoy bent down to examine a shelf full of skulls. Everyone thinks he's so smart. Wonderful Potter with his scar and his broomstick. You've told me this at least a dozen times already, said Mr. Malfoy with a quell look at his son, and I would remind you that it is not prudent to appear, appear less than fond of Harry Potter. Not when most of our kind regard him as a hero who made the Dark Lord disappear. Ah, Morgan. A stupid man had appeared behind the counter, smoothing his greasy hair back from his face. Mr. Malfoy, what a pleasure to see you, said Mr. Morgan, in a voice as oily as his hair. Delighted, and young Master Malfoy too, charmed. How may I be of service? I must show you just in today, and very reasonably priced. I'm not buying today, Mr. Morgan, but selling, said Mr. Malfoy. Selling. The smile faded slightly from Mr. Morgan's face. 
You've heard, of course, that the Ministry is conducting more raids. And Mr. Malfoy, taking a roll of parchment from his inside pocket and unraveling it for Mr. Borgen to read. I have a few items at home that might embarrass me if the Ministry were to call. Mr. Borgen fixed a pair of pince-sneezed pin, pince to his nose and looked down the list. The Ministry wouldn't presume to trouble you, sir, surely. Mr. Malfoy's lips curled. I have not been visited yet. The name Malfoy still commands a certain respect. Yet the Ministry grows ever more meddlesome. There are rumors about a new Muggle Protection Act. No doubt that flea-bitten, muggle-loving fool Arthur Weasley is behind it. Harry felt a hot surge of anger. And as you see, certain of these poisons might make it appear. I understand, sir, of course, said Mr. Borgen. Let me see. Can I have that? interrupted Draco, pointing at the withered hand on its cushion. Ah, the hand of glory, said Mr. Borgen, abandoning Mr. Malfoy's list and scurrying over to Draco. Insert a candle, and it gives only light to the beholder. Best friend of thieves and plunderers. Your son has fine taste, sir. I hope my son will amount to more than a thief or a plunderer, Borgen, said Mr. Malfoy coldly, and Mr. Borgen said quickly, No offense, sir. No offense meant. Though if his grades don't pick up, said Mr. Malfoy more coldly still, that may indeed be all he's fit for. It's not my fault, retorted Draco. The teachers all have favorites, that Hermione Granger. I would have thought you'd be shamed that a girl of no wizarding family beat you in every exam, snapped Mr. Malfoy. Huh, said Harry under his breath, pleased to see Draco looking both abashed and angry. It's the same all over, said Mr. Borgen, Borgen in his oily voice. Wizarding blood is counting for less everywhere. Not with me, said Mr. Malfoy, his long nostrils flaring. No, sir, nor with me, sir, said Mr. Borgen with a low bow. In that case, perhaps we can return to my list, said Mr. Malfoy shortly. I am something of a hurry, Borgen. I have important business elsewhere today. They started to haggle. Harry watched nervously as Draco drew nearer and nearer to his hiding place. Examining the objects for sale, Draco paused to examine a long coil of hangman's rope and to read, smirking, the card propped to a magnificent necklace of opals. Caution. Do not touch. Cursed. Has claimed the lives of 19 muggle owners to date. Draco turned around and saw the cabinet right in front of him. He walked forward. He stretched his hand out for the handle. Done, said Mr. Malfoy at the counter. Come, Draco. Harry wiped his forehead on his sleeve as Draco walked away. Good day to you, Mr. Bolgan. I'll expect you at the manor tomorrow to pick up the goods. The moment the door had closed, Mr. Borgen dropped his oily manner. Good day yourself, Mr. Malfoy. And if the stories are true, you haven't sold me half of what's hidden in your manor. Muttering darkly, Mr. Borgen disappeared into a back room. Harry waited for a minute in case he came back, and then quietly as he could, slipped out the cabinet, past the glass cases, and out the shop door. Clutching his broken glasses to his face, Harry stared around. He had emerged into a dingy alleyway that seemed to be made up of entirely shops devoted to the dark arts. The one he'd just left, Borgen and Burks, looked like the largest, but opposite was a nasty window display of shrunken heads and two doors down, a large cage was alive with gigantic spiders. Two shabby-looking wizards were watching him from the shadows of a doorway, muttering to each other. Feeling jumpy, Harry set off, trying to hold his glasses on straight, and hoping against hope he'd be able to find a way out of here. An old wooden street sign hung over a shop selling poisonous candles told him he was in Nocturne Alley. This didn't help as Harry had never heard of such a place. He supposed he had spoken clearly enough with his mouth full of ashes back in the Weasley's fire. Trying to stay calmed, he wondered what to do. Not lost, all you, my dear, said a voice in his ear, making him jump. An aged witch stood in front of him, holding a tray of what horribly looked like human fingernails. She leered at him, showing mossy teeth, and Harry backed away. 
I'm fine, thanks, he said. I'm just... Harry? What do you think you're doing down here? Harry's heart leapt. So did the witch. A load of fingernails cascading down over her feet, and she cursed as the massive form of Hagrid, the Hogwarts gamekeeper, came striding towards them, beetle black eyes flashing over his great bristly beard. Hagrid, Harry croaked in relief. I was lost. Flew powder. Hagrid seized Harry by the scruff of the neck and pulled him away from the witch, knocking the tray right out of her hands. Her shriek followed them all the way along the twisted alleyway out into the bright sunlight. Harry saw a familiar snow-white marble building in the distance, Green Gotts Bank. Hackard had steered him right into Diagon Alley. You're a mess, said Hackard gruffly, brushing soot off of Harry so forcefully he nearly knocked him into a barrel of dragon dung outside an apothecary. Sulking around, not to an alley. I don't know, dodgy place, Harry. Don't want no one to see you down there. I realize that, said Harry, ducking as Hackard made to brush him off again. I told you I was lost. What were you doing down there anyway? I was looking for flesh eating slug repellent, growled Hackard. The ruin in the school cabbages. You're not on your own, are you? I'm staying with the Weasleys, but we got separated, Harry explained. I've got to go and find them. They set off together down the street. How come you never wrote back to me, said Hackard as Harry jogged alongside him. He had to take three steps in every stride of Hackard's enormous boots. Harry explained all about Dobby and the Dursley. Lousy muggles, growled Hackard. If I'd have known. Harry! Harry, over here! Harry looked up and saw Hermione standing at the top of the white flight of steps to Gringotts. She ran down to meet them, her bushy brown hair flying behind her. What happened to your glasses? Hello, Hackard. Oh, it's wonderful to see you two again. Are you coming into Gringotts, Harry? As soon as I found the Weasleys, said Harry. You won't have to wait long, Hackard said with a grin. Harry and Hermione spun around, sprinting up the crowded streets were Ron, Fred, George, Percy, and Mr. Weasley. Harry, Mr. Weasley panted. We'd hoped you only gone one great too far. He mopped his glistening bald patch. Molly is frantic. She's coming now. Where did you come out at? Ron asked. Nocturne Alley, said Hackard grimly. Excellent, said Fred and George together. We've never been allowed in, Ron said enviously. I should ruddy think well not, growled Hackard. Mrs. Weasley now come galloping into her view, her handbag swinging wildly in one hand and Jenny just clinging to the other. Oh, Harry, my dear, you should have, you should have, you could have been anywhere. Gasping for breath, she pulled a large cloth brush out of her bag and began sweeping the soot off of Hackard. Hackard hadn't managed to beat away. Mr. Weasley took Harry's glasses, gave them a tap of his wand, and returned them, good as new. Well, off, gotta be off, said Hackard, who was having his hand wrung by Mrs. Weasley. Nocturne Alley, if you hadn't found him, Hackard. See you at Hogwarts. He strode away, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the packed street. Guess who I saw in Bergen and Bucks, Harry said to Ron and Hermione as they climbed the green got steps. Malfoy and his father. Did Lucius Malfoy buy anything? Said Mr. Weasley sharply behind them. No, he was selling. So he's worried, said Mr. Weasley with grim satisfaction. Oh, I'd love to get Lucius Malfoy for something. You be careful, Arthur, said Mrs. Weasley sharply as they were bowing into the bank by the goblin at the door. That family's trouble. Don't go biting off more than you can chew. So you don't think I'm a match for Lucius Malfoy, said Mr. Weasley, but he was distracted almost at once by the sight of Hermione's parents, who were standing nervously at the counter that ran along the great marble hall, waiting for Hermione to introduce them. But you're muggles, said Mr. Weasley, delighted. We must have a drink. What's that you've got there? Oh, you're changing muggle money. Molly, look. He pointed excitedly at the ten pound notes in Mr. Granger's hand. Meet you back here, Ron said to Hermione as the Weasleys and Harry were led off to their underground vaults by another Green Gots goblin. The vaults were reached by means of small goblin-driven cars that sped along miniature tracks through the bank's underground tunnels. Harry enjoyed the breaknecking journey down to Weasley's vault but felt dreadful far worse than he had in Nocturne Alley when it had opened. 
There was a small pile of silver sickles inside and one gold galleon. Mrs. Weasley felt right into the corner before sweeping the whole lot into her bag. Harry felt even worse when they reached his vault. He tried to balk the contents from view as he hastily shoved a handful of coins into a leather bag. Back outside on the marble steps, they were all separated. Percy muttered vaguely about needing a new quill. Fred and George had spotted their friend from Hogwarts, Lee Jordan. Mrs. Weasley and Jenny were going to a second-hand robe shop. Mr. Weasley was insisting on taking the Grangers off to the Leaky Cauldron for a drink. We'll all meet at Flourish and Blots in one hour to buy your school books, said Mrs. Weasley, setting off with Jenny. And not one step down, not to an alley, she shouted at the twins' retreating backs. Harry, Ron, and Hermione strolled off along the winding cobble streets. The bag of gold and silver and bronze jangling cheerfully in Harry's pocket was clamoring to be spent. So he bought three large strawberry and peanut butter ice creams, which they slurped happily as they watered up the alley, examining the fascinating window shops. Ron gazed longingly at a full set of Chudley Cannon robes in the window of quality Quidditch supplies until Hermione dragged them off to buy ink and parchment next door. In Gamble Jape's wizarding joke shop, they met Fred, George, and Lee Jordan, who were stocking up on Dr. Filibuster's fabulous wet start no heat fireworks and in a tiny junk shop full of broken wands lopsided brass scales and old cloaks covered in potion stains they found percy deeply immersed in a small and deeply boring book called prefects who gained power a study of hogwarts prefects and their later careers ron read aloud off the back cover that sounds fascinating go away percy snapped of course, he's very ambitious, Percy. He's got it all planned out. He wants to be Minister of Magic. Ron told Harry and Hermione in an undertone as they left Percy to it. An hour later, they headed for Flourish and Blots, where they were by no means the only ones making their way to the bookshop. As they approached it, they saw, to their surprise, a large crowd jostling outside the doors trying to get in. The reason for this was proclaimed by a large banner stretched across the upper windows. Gilderoy Lockhart will be signing copies of his autobiography, Magical Me, at 12.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. We can actually meet him, Hermione squealed. I mean, he's written almost the whole booklet. The crowd seemed to be made up mostly of witches around Mrs. Molly, Mrs. Weasley's age. A harassed-looking wizard stood at the door, saying calmly, Please, ladies, don't push. There. Mind the books now. Harry, Ron, and Hermione squeezed inside. A long line wound right up to the back of the shop where Gilderoy Lockhart was signing his books. They each grabbed a copy of the standard book of spells grade two and sneaked up the line to where the rest of the Weasleys were standing with Mr. and Mrs. Granger. Oh, there you are. Good, said Mrs. Weasley. She sounded breathless and kept patting her hair. We'll be able to see him in a minute. Gilderoy Lockhart came slowly into view, seated at a table surrounded by large pictures of his own face, all winking and flashing, dazzling smiles at the crowd. The real Lockhart was wearing robes of forget-me-not blue that exactly matched his eyes. His pointed wizard's hat was set at a jaunty angle on his wavy hair. A short, irritable-looking man was dancing around taking photographs with a large black camera that emitted puffs of purple smoke with every blinding flash. Out of the way there, he snarled at Ron, moving back to get a better shot. This is for the Daily Prophet. Big deal, said Ron, rubbing his foot where the photographer had stepped on. Gilderoy Lockhart heard him. He looked up, he saw Ron, and then he saw Harry. He stared. Then he leapt to his feet and positively shouted, It can't be Harry Potter. The crowd parted, whispering excitedly. Lockhart dived forward, seized Harry's arm, and pulled him to the front. The crowd burst into applause. Harry's face burned as Lockhart shook his hand for the photographer, who was clicking away madly, wafting thick smoke over the Weasleys. Nice big smile, Harry, said Lockhart through his own gleaming teeth. Together, you and I are worth the front page. When he finally let go of Harry's hand, Harry could hardly feel his fingers. He tried to sidle back over to the Weasleys, but Lockhart threw an arm around his shoulder and clamped him tightly to his side. Ladies and gentlemen, he said loudly, waving 
waving for quiet. What an extraordinary moment this is. The perfect moment for me to make a little announcement that I've been sitting on for some time. When young Harry here stepped into Flourish and Blots today, he only wanted to buy my autobiography, which I shall be happy to present him now free of charge. The crowd applauded loudly. He had no idea, Lockhart continued, giving Harry a little shake that made his glasses slip to the end of his nose, that he would shortly be getting much, much more than my book. Magical me. He and his schoolmates will, in fact, be getting the real magical me. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure and pride in announcing that this September I will be taking up the post of Defense Against the Dark Arts Teacher at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. The crowd cheered and clapped, and Harry found himself being presented with the entire works of Gilderoy Lockhart. Staggering slightly under their weight, he managed to make his way out of the limelight to the edge of the room where Jenny was standing next to her new cauldron. You have these, Harry mumbled to her, tipping the books into the cauldron. I'll buy my own. But you loved that, didn't you, Potter? said a voice Harry had no trouble recognizing. He straightened up and found himself face to face with Draco Malfoy, who was wearing his usual sneer. Famous Harry Potter, said Malfoy. Can't even go into a bookshop without making the front page. Leave him alone. He didn't want all of that, said Jenny. It was the first time she had spoken in front of Harry. She was glaring at Malfoy. Potter, you've got yourself a girlfriend, drawled Malfoy. Ginny went scarlet as Ron and Hermione fought their way over, both clutching stacks of Lockhart's books. Oh, it's you, said Ron, looking at Malfoy as if he were something unpleasant on the sole of his shoe. But you're surprised to see Harry here, eh? Not as surprised as I am to see you in a shop, Weasley, retorted Malfoy. I suppose your parents will go hungry for a month to pay for all those. Ron went as red as Jenny. He dropped his books into the cauldron, too, and started toward Malfoy. But Harry and Hermione grabbed the back of his jacket. Ron, said Mr. Weasley, struggling over with Fred and George. What are you doing? It's too crowded in here. Let's go outside. Well, 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 Arthur Weasley. It was Mr. Malfoy. He stood with his hand on Draco's shoulder, sneering just the same way. Lucius, said Mr. Weasley, nodding coldly. Busy time at the ministry, I hear, says Malfoy. All those raids. I hope they're paying you overtime. He reached into Jenny's cauldron and extracted from amidst the glossy Lockhart books a very old, very battered copy of A Beginner's Guide to Transfiguration. Obviously not, Mr. Malfoy said. Dear me, what's the use of being a disgrace to the name of wizard if they don't even pay you well for it? Mr. Weasley flushed darker than either Ron or Jenny. We have a very different idea of what disgrace is the name of wizard, Malfoy. He said, clearly, said Mr. Malfoy. His eyes pale, strained to Mr. and Mrs. Granger, who were watching apprehensively. The company you keep, Weasley, and I thought your family could sink no lower. There was a thud of metal as Jenny's cauldron went flying. Mr. Weasley had thrown himself at Mr. Malfoy, knocking him backwards into a bookshelf. Dozens of heavy spell books came thundering down on all their heads. There was a yell of, Get him, Don! from Fred and George. Mrs. Le Weasley was shrieking, No, Arthur, no! The crowd stampeded backwards, knocking more shelves over. "'Gentlemen, please! Please!' cried the assistant, and then louder than anything. "'Break it up, there, gents! Break it up!' Hackard was wading, wading towards them through a sea of books. In an instant, he had pulled Mr. Weasley and Mr. Malfoy apart. Mr. Weasley had a cut lip, and Mr. Malfoy had been hit in the eye with an encyclopedia of toadstools. He was still holding Jenny's old transfiguration book. He thrust it at her, his eyes glittering with malice. "'Here, girl!' Take your book. It's the best your father can give you. Pulling himself out of Hackard's grip, he beckoned to Draco and swept from the shop. You should have ignored him, Arthur, said Hackard, almost lifting Mr. Weasley off his feet as he straightened his robes. Rotten to the cold, the whole family. Everyone knows that. No Malfoy's worth listening to bad blood. That's what it is. Come on now. 
Let's get out of here. The assistant looked as though he wanted to stop them from leaving, but he barely came up to Hackard's waist and seemed to think better of it. They hurried up the street, the Granger shaking with fright and Mrs. Weasley beside herself with fury. A fine example to set for your children, brawling in public. What Gilderoy Lockhart must have thought. He was pleased, said Fred. Didn't you hear him as we were leaving? He was asking that bloke from the Daily Prophet if he'd be able to work the fight into his report. Said it was all publicity. But it was a subdued group that headed back to the fireside in the leaky cauldron where Harry, the Weasleys, and all their shopping would be traveling back to the burrow using flu powder. They said goodbye to the Grangers, who were leaving the pub for the Muggle Street on the other side. Mr. Weasley started to ask them how bus stops work, but stopped quickly at the look on Mrs. Weasley's face. Harry took off his glasses and put them safely in his pocket before helping himself to flu powder. It definitely was not his favorite way to travel. Thanks for staying with us for Chapter 4. We'll see you tomorrow for another reading. Bye, guys.